And this boiling the frog parable, it's an old parable, and the first video I'll show you will will explain to you what it is, uh, was an article written by one of the Cradle's writers, and it was actually called How Iranians Boil a Frog. Um, but the reel we made on our podcast about this story went viral. And um, I guess it's it, it's a it's the purpose of parables to to explain complex situations much more easily. And I think everybody understood that in the circumstance Israel finds itself in today, it is slowly and incrementally um, losing its 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 uh, its institutions, losing its narratives. Um, in all areas. Um, so it, it was something that went viral because it made sense and people could suddenly understand from an article called How Iranians Boil a Frog why the strategy of slow incremental hits at Israel over an extended protracted period of time could be more successful than a short hard war, which is kind of how the Israeli Arab wars of the past have been fought. Um, with no significant gains for the Arab side. So when you have a, a country like Israel, which is a colonial project supported by the unipolar world, how can you possibly fight it? You know, the, the most advanced army in the region in West Asia. Please, I urge all of you, regardless of what A and B policy is, to start using the term West Asia instead of the Middle East. The Middle East is a colonial narrative. West Asia is where we are geographically, and I will be using it a lot in this talk, yeah. Um, so, so although the article was about Iranians boiling a frog, you will see how this plays across all, all parts of the resistance axis from, from Lebanon to Iran, to the Palestinian resistance, to the Iraqi resistance, uh, factions, to Yemen's Ansarullah, et cetera. Um, let's jump forward. I will just play the little viral video if I can. You want us to be very tough. Nope, that didn't work. Does anyone know how this can be played? Ah, thank you. Very calculating, it's just got that I want to just about bro an article that we will publish this week, and the article is called How Do Iranians Boil a Frog? Quote, Legend has it that a frog placed in a shallow pot of water heating on a stove will remain happily in the pot of water as the temperature continues to climb and will not jump out even as the water slowly reaches boiling point and kills the frog. The change of one degree of temperature to time is so gradual that the frog doesn't realize he is being boiled until it's too late. Now, this has been Iran's asymmetrical strategy towards Israel. Don't engage directly in the war to make Iran a clear target for Israel, but have its allies engage. And they are doing it of their own volition, and their allies are not state actors, right? So it's like a swarm from here, from there, from Yemen, from Iraq, from Lebanon, from Gaza, from the West Bank. Israel gets truly swarmed. Look at Israel's condition today. Its economy is in shambles. Hundreds of thousands of Israelis in the north and the south have been displaced. No homes, no jobs. The blockade of its vital shipping uh, waterways, the Eilat port, is disabled, and it knows that its, its Mediterranean ports, Ashdod and Haifa, can be disabled too. 80% of Israelis outside say they will not return. And you're going to see with the new uh, conscription laws that um, you're going to have a huge exodus of ultra Orthodox Jews, um, hundreds of not thousands of Israeli soldiers dead, and international pariah status. This is how Iran is boiling the fraud. Okay, so one of the things I've always argued is to, um, uh, okay, um, is in this global narratives game. Um, oops, sorry. <laughs> How do you go to the next one? Okay. In the global narratives game, what we tend to do in this region is, you know, the I always say the West dominates the narratives, but now we in the East control the outcomes on the ground. Do not forget this. After a decade or more of the Syrian war, they were not able to win. 
after Lebanese Syrian uh, 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 Lebanese civil war after the um, invasion of Lebanon, they were not able to win. They can deplete, but they can't win. We now control the ground, but we still fall into their narrative traps. Come on in. We still fall into their narrative traps. And what is the narrative trap? It's when um, they say something, and it's so absurd, like, for instance, the Telegraph article that came out a few weeks ago or, or a month ago saying that uh, Hezbollah was hiding shipments of missiles at uh, Rafi Hariri Airport in Beirut. And, of course, the government went over with ambassadors and reporters to show the hangars and that this was not the case. But we keep reacting to their narratives. By reacting to their narratives, we become rejections in their narrative game, or rejectionists, and we give oxygen to their narratives. One way to change this is for us to craft our own narratives. And I promise you, within no time, they will start to become rejectionists in our narrative and give it oxygen. So this is something very subtle, but they understand it very well, and we don't. We react, okay? We need to form these narratives now and stick by them. You know, we're not just making up stuff like they do. We're actually talking about real things that are happening in the region. You don't budge from them. They become the rejectionists. So um, one of the things this Boiling the Frog video did was, yeah, it went viral, but an Israeli official became a rejectionist of our narrative. And that happened within a week or two. It was fantastic. At the cradle, we were bubbling with joy. And this was the Israeli ambassador um, to the UN, Gilad Erdal. And he did this speech at the UN Security Council, and we couldn't believe the words that came out of his mouth. Every red line. And Israel reserves the legal right to retaliate. We are not a frog in oily water. We are a nation of liars. It, the, the frog parable is very, very old. We couldn't... Didn't came up with that. We just saw this. So we had a writer, Shivan Ma Jehan... What? I don't want to get it wrong. It's too long. They... Um, Marajendra, I think, um, who wrote this article, and I loved it, and I actually spoke about it in our podcast. Um, the people who make the reels for our podcast loved that story. They put, they made a reel out of it. That went viral, and then all of a sudden we hear this, the UN Security Council. So we just, you know, we have a thing at the cradle where we'd like to start forming the narratives and having them reject ours. And this was such a beautiful one, you know, because people saw it and people responded to it very positively. And I think the parable helped a lot of people understand, you know, this question when after Gaza started, why aren't the Arab states doing anything about this? And then it was like, why isn't Hezbollah acting? What is this rubbish? You know, these little silly clashes across the border. Why aren't they doing more? So the parable of the boiling frog made a lot of people understand that this is how you, you, you get your enemy you boil it incrementally. Hopefully it doesn't notice for some time until it's past a tipping point. Um, so here's what I'm going to do. So Israel is heading towards a breakdown of the state. This is across all sectors, political, military, economic, and societal. We started seeing signs of this before October 7th. OK, with the big uh, judicial reform protests, um, many Israeli Jews talking. OK, many Israeli Jews talking about leaving the country, that this was now in a liberal state with uh, the most extremist coalition government in the history of the state. Um, but October 7th events exacerbated it and accelerated it. Uh, furthermore, this breakdown is here's the thing. So these fragmentations are happening across these sectors, but also institutionally and foundationally. Um, but important is that during these disruptions of the state, the state and its governing bodies are unable to form and create urgently needed corrections. Okay, there is no band aid solutions for these. These are foundational changes that need to be made. The breakdown is also happening during a time of war on five different fronts. It's very hard to govern during war in general, but not when you're 
you know, you're, you're, you're engaged on every one of your borders. Um, and importantly, it's happening during a time of international political disorder globally. Okay. And that's happening because we're moving from a unipolar world to, I want to say, a bipolar world in the sense that since the Cold War, we haven't had two poles. And now we have a second pole emerging to challenge the unipolar uh, world. Um, and then beyond that, a multipolar order. So I hope everybody understands that part because Israel is not just waging a war. It is fundamentally also affected by the geopolitics, not just in the region, but globally. The comfort it had before during a unipolar world no longer exists. And I will show you why. So the lecture is going to break down the elements contributing to Israel's collapse. Okay. Military, societal, economic, and political. Um, and then the second much shorter part will be the global conditions that may accelerate this. Um, at its core, Israel is a colonial project, okay? It's an artificial project. These are imported populations, imported ideas, imported systems of governance to West Asia. Um, it has used the most questionable sliver of legitimacy, God is a real estate agent, to normalize its existence. Um, but it also is the most advanced conventional military force with qualitative weapons in the region. Okay, so now boiling a frog undetected is a process. It takes time. It's also a full spectrum war. So information, narratives, psychological, military, economic, societal, cyber, um, but you but you first have to understand the enemy, which is, I think, something that the resistance axis really has done very well, um, because the resistance axis uh, is, is very strategic thinker. Um, I would say this is something that is permeated to most of its parts. Uh, in order to understand the enemy, you have to know what its foundational vulnerabilities are and its foundational strengths. Um, I posit that Israel, or the frog in this case, stands only on two legs, okay? There's only two things holding Israel up. One is its myths and its fairy tales. Everything from, uh, you know, uh, perpetual victimhood, right? Uh, the Holocaust, therefore we were entitled to something, to this was a swamp and we made it a garden, um, to we are the only democracy in West Asia. We are the only country in West Asia that shares values with the unipolar world. Uh, the myths and the fairy tales are just astounding. They absolutely shape not just the narrative of what Israel is, but what its enemies are. They're savages. They're brutal. They're violent. They surround us. They just want to kill Jews, you know, uh, and on and on and on. But the, and, and, and this is what's, helped people excuse Israel all along. You know, you cannot touch the Holocaust industry. You can not make a dent in it. Um, the second leg that this frog stands on is Jews moving to Israel. Without Jews moving to Israel, there is no Jewish state. There is no political Zionism, period. Uh, both of Israel's legs have been fractured badly since October 7th. Jews are leaving the state in greater numbers than before. Um, Israel is considered a pariah state by many, uh, and getting there, we have had ICJ and ICC rulings, or, you know, on Israel since, the, since October 7th. This is kind of astounding. You know, the ICC or ICJ is reserved for African leaders and Vladimir Putin, not for Israel, you know. Um, so why would Israel's enemies take on a state um, with a full-on military reprisal? Uh, is this a possibility, okay? Because I'm positing that boiling the frog is the only possibility, and it will um, necessarily end the state, okay? you can't. There's no in-between, unless the war was stopped and the first month of Gaza. They could have done that. They didn't. 
Now it is an existential war for Israel. Why did the uh, resistance axis not attack Israel full on with all its new missiles and secret tactics and stuff that have been developed since 2006 and, and whatnot? Um, the reason is because any war against Israel from multiple fronts at the same time would have absolutely galvanized Israel's Western allies um, with their infinite military arsenals. They would have come full on and participate in the war to ensure Israel wins. Um, it would have galvanized all Israelis behind their government because uh, uh, since the time of David Ben-Gurion, the Israeli military has, uh, the state has had one military strategy and it is short, fast, hard wars. And then an interim period of a few years or longer even where you have peace, where you can create the semblance of peace, um, a different reality, where you can restock, you know, your munitions, where you can, you know, make, you can, you can lift the morale of people. We won, we won, we're stronger than ever, right? They need this. They need quick, short wars and then uh, a period a period of years in which to breathe. And this has been, there have been 13 major wars that Israel has has uh, executed, and in between those many hits on Gaza, etc., um, in between. So a quick short war by the resistance axis would have not, would, would, have, would, would have been a gift to the Israeli military establishment. Okay? It would not have been able to create this slow bloodletting of Israeli society, Israeli institutions, that would just simply not have existed. Um, no, for the end of the colonial project, you need to tear apart the fabric of the state across its sectors and institutions and to incrementally destroy its myths. Now, as in the Syrian war, where at the beginning it was uh, Assad is killing everybody, right? After a few years, you saw that the Protests were not peaceful. People were armed. You know, the longer these things go on, the more um, you're able to see what's happening behind the curtain. And during these now 11 months, everybody on this planet, via TikTok, via Instagram, via Twitter, via social media platforms, have been able to see the Israelis rampaging across Gaza with zero consider consideration for human lives calling Palestinians all kinds of, of things, you know, animal names, cockroaches, rats, etc. The dehumanization of Palestinians, the easy killing of a Palestinian, the absolute disregard for military targets versus civilian ones. They seem to enjoy targeting civilians, you know, um, looting the homes of Palestinians who have been dispersed and displaced and living in tents. Um, the, the the horrible statements that uh, from Israeli officials from this coalition government, you know, um, if if people weren't watching us, I would gladly starve all of Gaza and we would be done with the problem, you know, from from one of its extremist ministers. There have been so many, countless, which is why there is a legitimate case for genocide at the uh, International Court of Justice, um, and that was then. There's just been so much more. So dragging out this war, um, fleshing out this war has slowly destroyed Israel's myths of democracy, of liberal democracy, of human rights, of victimhood. Um, and in essence, the Israeli myth of this is the safest place for Jews in the world has very quickly for Israeli Jews talking among, among themselves become the least safe place for Jews in the world. So a war of attrition, a protracted war by the axis of resistance, is in order, this time instead of a disparate enemy with conflicting goals, so what Syria wanted versus what Egypt wanted, you know, what Jordan wanted in the old Arab-Israeli wars, you have what we're, we now understand is the unity of fronts, okay? All aspects of this axis of resistance contributing in their own way to the dissolution of the state, um, I would say, let me say this is me being <laughs> um, forward thinking about this, the axis itself does not foresee, believe that this is the war um, or that the state will dissolve at this time. Um, I think they're uh, reading this wrong. I think Israel is on a downward spiral. Uh, 
it is an existential one and it will be unable to extricate itself even if the war ends now. And I will show you why shortly. So um, you have the unity of fronts now on five separate fronts, engaging the state's resources and depleting them one brick at a time. Since October 7th, Israel's destruction has accelerated in four key areas, economic, military, political, societal. So as you can see from this first chart, Israel's military spending has just shot through the roof um, in, uh, you know, a very short period. Uh, so as I said, there was so much data. I kept in things that I felt like I had to keep in or maybe had an interesting story to it. Okay, so... Um, this this could be a much longer presentation. So Moody, Moody is one of the three major um, uh, risk assessors uh, for 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 states for states economies finances. Um, Moody reported uh, a month after the the October seventh events that the war was costing Israel two hundred sixty nine million dollars every day. Uh, recently, we've seen figures uh, in the last month or two that the war has already cost the Israeli economy more than $67.3 billion. That calculation today, which I did before I came here, uh, has reached already over $8 billion, uh, sorry, $80 billion. I think that's on the low side because just some of the operation, like we saw the Iranian uh, retaliatory strikes on Israel of, uh, April 14th, cost Israel over a billion dollars just that one night. Okay, so some of these things are not considered, but this is an average, $80 billion. Um, the Israeli defense establishment is already asking for an increase in its annual military budget, um, that much like the U.S. has been every single year. The, these, are, these are warring states. They never go down in their military expenses. They only go up. Um, so a little snapshot of what this has done to the military, they have... 2,200 tanks and armored vehicles in their um, in their inventory, the Israeli army. Um, more than 500 Israeli armored vehicles have been damaged in Gaza since the start of the war. That's, you know, close to a quarter. And this is in Gaza. Gaza. You know, with locally produced munitions. Okay? Nothing coming from Iran, nothing coming from Egypt or anywhere. This is locally produced munitions. Tactics. It's some aspect of this is tactical genius. The Israelis say 704 of their troops have been killed in combat. Um, we believe this is a low estimate. The cradle did an investigation a few months ago when the Israelis said there were less than two dozen killed on the northern border. We found that there were over 200 killed on that border. So, you know, the, the Israelis, uh, for their own domestic concerns, you know, always try to censor. They censor a lot of military data, but they also um, downplay their their kills. Um, but and this is also, I believe, a very low number. The defense ministry has said that over 10,000 Israeli soldiers have um, been injured since the 7th of October. Uh I want to speak to this because Israel has about 170,000 active military personnel and about 465,000 reservists. Um, according to the defense ministry, you can see 35% on this chart have struggle with mental disorders, um, with severe postpartum, uh, post-traumatic stress disorder and other mental disorders caused by trauma. Another 37% were suffering physical trauma to their limbs. Missing limbs, okay? A third of Israeli casualties, okay, injuries, are missing limbs, arms, or legs, okay? This is not an insignificant number. Um, and uh, every single month, a thousand are being added to this list. Again, I think these are lowball estimates. Especially since the war, the temperature of the war has increased, continues to escalate. Uh, so, so what's interesting is that the Israelis have calculated, and this is according to a study conducted by two Israeli groups, that the cost of the Israeli economy over the next five years will be $50 billion in just dealing with stress. 
Okay, for, this is from p uh, people who have post-traumatic uh, stress from October 7th, from combat in Gaza, from combat on the northern border. They did not include in, in what I saw the West Bank, but surely the West Bank is now, as you guys know in this last week, opening up. Today, the uh, Minister of, of Settlements uh, said that we need to declare a war on the West Bank. We need to make this a official declaration. So... Um, under the military section, military allies, countries like Belgium, Spain, the Netherlands, Italy, Sol Slovenia, Norway, and the UK have announced either complete ban of arms sales to Israel or restrictions. Okay. I will say though, that a lot of this is because of their own domestic concerns, because there's a lot of anti-Israel sentiment on the streets, you know, weekly protests um, with tens of thousands, not hundreds of thousands. I've been in London. These protests just grow in number, um, and uh, but but there's a lot of the a lot of these countries are doing third party transfers to Israel. So everyone's playing dirty. The Turks banned I think 52 categories of of um, exports to Israel, but we did an article the Cradle showing that all of a sudden Greece was suddenly exporting so much more to Israel. They were Turkish goods going via Greece. Okay, so. Um, people are, all countries are concerned about their, their, their economy. There's not a lot of like, uh, human sympathy, even from neighboring countries, Muslim countries, Arab countries. Um, any, so, so the, a, a group of, a massive group, I think it was like every UN special rapporteur in the UN establishment got together in February and, and declared that any transfer weapons or munitions to Israel that would be used in Gaza is um, likely to be a violation of international humanitarian law and must stop immediately. So, you know, what's happening is these incremental also like raising of the temperature on on law, on the legality of things where you've seen like people at the U.S. State Department, people at the British Foreign Office, you know, biggest Israeli allies quitting their jobs, saying I will become liable if there's a lawsuit. And because the ICJ and ICC are taking these on, right? at the highest level, the highest courts in the world, um, these any rulings coming out of these institutions opens the door, really cracks open Pandora's box to um, reams and reams of private lawsuits and even state lawsuits against Israel. Um, Israel is entirely dependent on foreign munitions and their supply. Uh, the Hezbollah Secretary General Hassan Nasrallah in, I think, a few months into the war, said that since the first month of the war, Israel ran out of munitions, okay, projectiles. Um, and uh, ever since has been receiving shipments from its allies. Uh, uh, last week, we did a piece at the cradle, I think people saw this all over, that the 500th air transfer of U.S. weapons had arrived, you know, you, you get a gold medal for that. And that doesn't include an additional over 100 uh, shiploads of munitions and uh, military hardware from the United States, um, the total amounting to 50,000 tons of military supplies. Imagine that Gaza was their main theater and how much has been expended on this tiny strip of land, okay? Um, anyways, pressure is on its military allies to increasingly, if the UK is pulled away from this, it is the US that is its unconditional military supplier now and the heat will be rising on the US too. Um, we may have all seen these quotes. Uh, the main Israeli military's spokesperson, Daniel Hagari, in June said this business of um, destroying Hamas, making Hamas disappear, it's simply throwing sand in the eyes of the Israeli public, okay, lying to the Israeli public. Hamas is an idea. Hamas is a party. It's rooted in the heart of the people. Anyone who thinks we can eliminate Hamas is wrong. Now, this is also an interesting thing happening societally inside Israel, domestic strife. The military and Netanyahu's coalition are at odds, and that seems to be increasing. As you see, Yoav Gallant, the Israeli defense minister, can barely sit in a room with Netanyahu. You know, they're usually there for photo ops and not much else. And uh, Netanyahu is constantly talking about replacing him, but I think the Americans have insisted he stays for at least now. Um, but when you have the head military spokesman say, um, we can't eliminate Hamas, you know, when Netanyahu every day says our goal is to eliminate Hamas. So is Israel from the onset is unable to achieve its military, its strategic objective in Gaza. Not possible. 
this is very important. Yitzhak Brick, who was the former ombudsman of the of the Israeli army, okay, and an IDF reserve general, who has spoken up very interestingly, you should Google him, during the course of this conflict from October 7th onwards, he has pointed out the absolute vulnerabilities of the Israeli military strategy in Gaza and Lebanon um, throughout. And very smartly, we are sinking to the mud, losing fighters who were killed and wounded with no chance of achieving the main goal. Indeed, the country is galloping to depreciation. If the war of attrition against Hamas and Hezbollah continues, Israel will collapse in no more than a year. This is the Israeli military ombudsman from our prior one. Okay, Israel will collapse in no more than a year. We're not even talking about this at AUB with a lot of Lebanese people, people who are maybe pro-resistance axis or, you know, we live in the region, we care because Israel's always attacking us. The Israelis are saying this. They are saying this at the highest levels. I mean, I want to say something. The cradle reads the Hebrew press every day, all day long. Every single thing we write about in, in terms of Israel, you know, people view us as biased against Israel. Everything we get is from the Hebrew press. Their officials are talking this way. It is a very vibrant um, community in terms of, um, you know, disagreements. You have the sort of more liberal papers, more conservative, more extremists, et cetera. So you get quite a lot of um, great information from there. Um, this, we did an article on this last week. I just want to point something out to you. So, you know, if you're looking at a military escalation ladder is do you, we don't need the mic do we do we need the mic for there okay so I, I um the top of the ladder is when you've shot your wad you've done everything right the bottom of the ladder is when you've hardly done anything all right so without having actual data um we're positing that and this doesn't work, or maybe it does, and I'm holding it upside down. Yeah, it does. Okay. Um, okay. So why is Israel at the top of the ladder? Let's say this is one, two, three, four, five. So 100%, these are 20% increments, okay? Um, I posit that Israel is at 80%. Why is it at 80% of its military capabilities? Because, first of all, ran out of munitions in month one or two, okay? Every bit of munitions it gets is from... A foreign country, it's from the United States. And the United States is also, um, you know, knee-deep in a war in Ukraine, and it is a very important war for the Americans. Um, Israel has deployed its armored vehicles all over the place on three borders, so the northern border, south of Gaza, and the West Bank, okay? Um, and these very, the, the, the resistance factions, the Palestinian resistance factions and the uh, Lebanese resistance are constantly taking out their tanks, okay? So there's a depletion of that. Here's why it's at the top, though. It's because Israel is the only one of these parties to have deployed its entire armed forces, its regular military personnel and its reservists. They keep trying to call up more. Now they're turning to the ultra-Orthodox, the Haradim, to try to draft them into the army. And that's going to be another source of civil conflict, okay? Hamas, I put up there because Hamas is obviously, you know, in the Gaza Strip. It is creating munitions in underground labs. It has its tunnel network. It doesn't have a constant supply of things. Hamas fighters are fully deployed in the military theater there. So in that sense, they're on par with Israel in terms of um, how deeply engaged they are in this war with all their resources. Okay. Hezbollah is, yeah, at least 40% down. I, I really, it's just, you know, very loose um, characterizations. Hezbollah has, uh, I, I've put it higher than the rest because it has been engaged for the last 10, 11 months in um, not necessarily daily, but weekly clashes, okay? So it is very regular and very continuous um, for almost a year. Uh, so they have depleted some stock, but as we know, they haven't brought out their surprises yet. So um, in terms of uh, escalation, Hezbollah has a long way to go. We haven't seen their surprises. We don't know if they can take down Israeli aircraft. We haven't seen their you know, ballistic missiles used. We've seen like a, 
a special drone here and there. Um, in their last operation, their retaliation. You're grinning. Thank you for the. <gasps> Sorry, she's like boosting my morale here. I just have to look at her, and she's just one big grin. Um, uh, uh, what was I saying? Care. Oh, they've been. Are they coming in? They they haven't used ballistic missiles. Oh, in their last uh, retaliatory operation, um, the previous Sunday, they did their largest salvo ever, which was 340 um, Katyusha missiles or rockets. Rockets, not even missiles. So Katyusha has been used for decades here. Okay, it's not like a biggie. Um, and in our view, we can talk about this later. I think it was just entirely a decoy to hit the real targets. Um, so Hezbollah's not using much. And importantly, it has, um, its troops do not engage at all with the enemy. Nothing. They're not exhausted. You know, they're literally, yes, they are killing Hezbollah fighters, but they're in artillery positions. They're not on frontline positions. So there is a long way for Hezbollah to go up the ladder. Um, Iraqi resistance in Yemen, I've put lower... Uh, I don't even think it's that high because uh, Yemen very easily, it has domestic missile production, as you know. Um, it claims to have developed a hypersonic missile before the United States. We shall see. Um, but Yemen only periodically uh, shoots projectiles, mostly at Israeli-linked or Israeli-destined shipment vessels. Uh, Red Sea, Gulf of Oman, Indian Ocean, now the Mediterranean. So it's it, it's uh, expanded its theater of operations, but it is um, sporadic. The Iraqi resistance also sporadic missile um, uses and rocket use, um, oftentimes against U.S. targets now in Syria and in Iraq. Um, and Iran is at the bottom of the ladder because it's once engaged with the enemy. Okay, um, and per the Iranian uh, disclosures, they were they used four different kinds of missile types. None of them were their new missiles. Uh, so, I mean, they have all the way to go in this. Um, okay. Okay. Now we move into politics, uh, domestic strife. I'll go through this really quickly. Um, the uh, opinion poll. Israeli opinion polls say that 75% uh, of Israelis believe their government's handling of the war in the north is poor. 55% um, of Israelis favor early elections. 73% of Israelis don't trust their government. Interestingly, vast majority of Israel support the war in Gaza. Um, many want it even harder. And, uh, um, uh, uh, and, and they don't trust their government yet. It looks like Netanyahu, well, a few months ago, we heard that if there was a, a, a election held then, Netanyahu would win. But right now, it doesn't look like his coalition would win. His opposition would have a few more seats. But the Israelis have had, uh, what, five governments in five years, something like that. Uh, well, a lot. Um, because they are really struggling. Oh, with coalition governments. I have 10 minutes. Okay. Um, secular versus religious versus extremist. This is another um, uh, cause of strife in Israel. It's very extreme. Um, there are many trigger events that can set off uh, civil civil conflict in Israel. Judicial overhaul. We saw before October 7th, the Haredim army drafts settler, putting any restraints on the settlers who have really been let out of the you know uh, their 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 cages now. Um, and then of course the hostage crisis, which we just saw yesterday with hundreds of thousands of Israelis coming to the streets. 46% um, of Israelis fear the possibility of a civil war. Um, and then Netanyahu says there will be no civil war. He put the narrative on the table. He had to say this because people think there will be a civil war. Okay, diplomatic losses. A lot of countries after October 7th um, started severing ties or calling back their ambassadors. Uh, the state of Palestine is now recognized by 146 countries around the world with more joining the list in 2024. Um, 143 of the 193 members of the UN General Assembly voted in favor of Palestine joining the UN. Um, this never would have happened if October 7th hadn't happened and the war in Gaza hadn't happened. And then a vast majority of um, UN General Assembly resolutions uh, are focused on a single country, Israel. This is a real pain for international players who were able to deal with Israel because it 
wasn't a focus. Now Israel's a focus. Everyone's finding it hard to deal with them. Global image. This is such an important quote from Senator Ch Chuck Schumer. He's the Senate Majority Leader, Democrat, longtime Israel supporter. And he said in March um, during testimony, Israel cannot survive if it becomes a pariah. This is very true. Guess what? Because it's the first foundational leg, right? The myths and the fairy tales. If Israel becomes a pariah, the myths and fairy tales are dead. And it's like it's one leg is broken. Um, these are all, you know, showing global support for Israel, diminishing even the United States. I love this figure. Forty six percent of Americans, young Americans support Hamas against Israel. OK, a lot of young Americans going to be arrested this year. Um, Fifty four percent of them believe Israel is not trying to avoid civilian casualties. Again, pariah, pariah, pariah. Um, this is just a snapshot. Losses inflicted on the Israeli economy are tremendous. Investment declines. You know, a lot of Israel's financial buoyancy was because every single retirement fund in the West, you know, had to put in something into the Israeli pot. Everybody did. That's how it works. OK, um, but you had the biggest British retirement fund pull out of uh, investing in Israel. And guess what? Every single university, major university in, in the Western world is now looking at having university funds being pulled out of Israeli investments. Um, the Israeli economy is contracted. Um, public spending is cor uh, it has contracted. Government spending has contracted significantly. So it may have its budgets, but those line items are being diverted to war efforts. Okay. Um, as much as one third of Israel's agricultural land has been removed in these conflicts in the north and the south, they can't access them. OK, and 40 percent cuts in the agricultural sector. All right. International flights to Israel, international carriers down significantly. Um, the Israeli Central Bank says that 46,000 companies went bankrupt. That was sometime this summer and expects 60,000 Israeli companies to be bankrupt. Um, government spending increases, 40, 60 percent decline in investments in all sectors, and its prized technology sector is getting um, hit significantly as well. I mean, to have that cut a third is like un was unimaginable a year ago. Um, but the tourism thing, five million tourists to Israel are now 277,000 and decreasing all the time. Um, we, we saw a figure at the cradle where um, there were as many Israelis traveling between um, January and June of this year to Israel as were traveling to Lebanon in just the month of June. So we're more resilient over here. <laughs> um, exports plummet. Uh, it's not just the Eilat port that's shut down. Yemen made the Eilat port shut down. This was a major, major Israeli port. It's where they cut through all the roundabout traffic and they come through the Red Sea to a lot that is gone um, and even Ashdod port has collapsed in terms of what it can what, what, what it brings in um, transshipments which is important for a country that's trying to per, um, position its hubs itself as a hub for international trade and commerce um, so that means ships come to Israel they unload their ships onto other ships that go in many different directions that's kind of finishing all right for even the Ashdod port which is not hit um, okay, listen to this. So all these costs that Yemen inflicted on Israeli shipping, and Israel gets 80% of its imports via shipping. Okay, so this is considerable. Um, the risk factors were so great for for um, uh, sh shippers that uh, in, in this one example, fuel tanker day rates from West Asia to the Netherlands jumped from $23,000 per day to $73,000 per day in just one month. And these, you know, costs keep accumulating. Um, okay, Fitch. Fitch, like Moody's, another of the big three uh, risk assessors of countries and economies and financial systems, um, says that they believe the conflict in Gaza could last well into 2025, which would add significant military spending, destruction of Israeli infrastructure, and more sustained damage to its economy. So again, more. Uh, and then the last one is Israel had the biggest drop of any country in the Organization of Economic Cooperation Development. Um, so dropped 
its uh, growth rate by half. Um, so society, and we're getting to the end. This is the least safe place for Jews. This is, if you look at this number at the end, this is just from uh, October to January and just from Gaza. Okay, Israelis have never experienced that many incoming projectiles, you know, since 2006, at least, okay? This is in the early days, and, uh, and, and it is, and this is the perception. Uh, reverse aliyah. So what was the second leg Israel stands on? Jews moving there. Jews are not moving there. They're moving out, okay? So over half a million Jews have departed the country between October and June. Um, a, a quarter million or more Israelis have been displaced by conflict in the north and south of the country. Israelis are applying for second passport in much larger amounts than before. Um, interestingly, according to the Israeli media, the most prominent reason for reverse aliyah is not even the, uh, the, the, the conflict in Gaza and the conflict in the north, but um, a, a sense of a loss of security coming from the coalition's move to the extreme right. Uh, there's too much to say here. I don't really want to say. Uh, so so Israelis, Israelis, by and large, believe they want to wage this war. They're all in support of this war. But only 8.5% believe that Israel's war goals can be achieved completely um, uh, Harvard professor Stephen Walt, this is important, he says the deepest problem face facing Israel is the gradual erosion of Israeli strategic thinking over the past 50 years. Why this is important, and this is something Gore Leish, who is a former senior director for national security strategy at Israel's National Security Council, this is the guy, okay? He says we've moved away from the military strategy that's existed since the beginning of the state, since David Ben-Gurion, which was short, hard, fast wars, okay, with breathing space of years in between. We are now in a forever war that we cannot win, okay? And we, we are not even, we're just doing it, we're executing it, but we're not considering the limitations on our power, our economy, and society. And that's the end of that section. I, the, the ending part, you've got to give me a few minutes, is really short. It's... Um, some geopolitical context. I hope in the first part I showed you how every part, every sector in Israel is being severely depleted, damaged um, by the um, by this protracted war. Uh, and at the same time as the axis of resistance is waging this war on of attrition on 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 Israel, there's been a historical geopolitical shift we have not seen since the Cold War, and then before that, the World Wars, okay? So new institutions emerging on the global stage, uh, stage like the BRICS, um, which has now expanded as of this year, and then the SCO, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, which is a security and economic organization. As these um, organizations emerge, um, and I think as China's economic behemoth becomes so much more apparent and threatening to the U.S., and the Russian military surprise, also very startling to the U.S. These two U.S. adversary or identified as adversary states are becoming strategically closer um, and carrying along with them a number of global South states that are enjoying the ability to have leverage for the first time, not being entirely in a unipolar world. They can now play with both sides to get the best deal for their own interests, like the Saudis and the Emiratis who, you know, after the Ukraine war, the Americans wanted them to cut, uh, uh, to raise oil production so the price of oil would go down, right, for Europe. And they refused to do so. Uh, and this is because they had the Russians with them. So Global South countries are viewing, if they're not pro-Russia or pro-China, it doesn't matter. They're viewing them as a way to leverage their very, you know, the, 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 the unipolar stranglehold on them. This gives us more flexibility. You're seeing this everywhere from the Sahel in Africa. You know, you're seeing this in West Asia. But look what's interesting is that with just China and Russia there, you have, um, um, no, how does this affect Israel specifically? Okay, first of all, um, Israel 
was able to move forward with impunity on anything it did because it was just a unipolar world and America made it possible for Israel to do anything it wanted and escape censure or punishment. Um, but if that's not the world anymore and you have a multipolar world, with people who have different opinions, global South countries, um, that's going to affect it. But look at the examples in the region. Russia and Iran have a strategic military relationship now. China and Iran have a strategic economic relationship now, a 25-year one. Um, Russia has re-engaged in Syria, so into in West Asia, okay, has military bases now. Russia got to know Hezbollah during the Syrian war very intimately. Russia and China are very engaged with Hamas, with many meetings to Beijing and uh, and and uh, uh, Moscow by the Palestinian resistance. I swear I'm almost done. Um, uh, Egypt and the UAE are now in the BRICS. Um, Palestine last week submitted uh, an application to join the BRICS, and Turkey today has asked to join the BRICS formally. Okay, um, Russia, China, and Iran have all offered uh, um, very detailed proposals for Persian Gu Gulf security. Uh, that is only where the Persian Gulf would only be protected by littoral states. So no foreign forces in the Persian Gulf. OK. Um, and, uh, you know, it, 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 so on and so forth. How does this not impact Israel regionally, even its reliance on the Abraham Accords to take it to the next, you know, the next era forward is has stopped, has stopped with Gaza, with stopped with Saudi normalization. If Israel escalates on the West Bank, even the UAE can't stomach that. The Jordanians can't stomach it. You know, we're we're just Israel keeps making things more difficult for itself. And um, this is what I was going to say: the trajectory that Israel is on, a more strategic thinker, a wiser thinker, would cut its losses and take that breather that Ben Gurion made sure Israeli military did after every war. But. Netanyahu's war is a forever war, war until victory. It means no matter what, Israel refuses to get off its trajectory. It will not get off its trajectory. It will continue because it, it is in a bubble, believing it has impunity because that's all it's known. But as time moves on, that impunity will fray with the new geopolitical circumstances. And uh, if Israel doesn't have its image and Jews leave, it's the end of the state. And the pit and me didn't come out, I reckon. That, thank you very much for such a riveting lecture. Once we get power back on, we'll, uh, you can all think a few questions. Thank you, Shamin. That was uh, a wonderful, inciting, educational uh, lecture. There's an awful lot to think about. You don't have to all agree. Uh, please, uh, when, you, when the lights come back on and you want to ask questions, please sort of give everyone a chance. Uh, ask a question as opposed to making a speech. I know some... Ah, it's happened. Would you be kind enough to pass the microphone? Yeah, one of my students. I might, anyone? So if you can... Anyone with a question, please. Yes, thank you. My name is, is Tony Bazzi. I'm from the Faculty of Medicine. Tony Bazzi. Thank you for a very rich lecture. I have a basic question, and please take it at face value. What is the axis of resistance? And who coined that term anyway? And then you showed us that slide with the letter. You said Iraqi resistance. Iraq is a sovereign government with two parallel forces, armed forces. So what is Iraqi resistance and whom are they resisting? And the last comment, when you said at the very beginning, after so many years in Syria, they were not able to win, that would insult millions of people, you know. Who, who won in Syria? Who won? Is there a Syria now? Oh, no, don't do that to me. I have like a memory for goldfish. Wait. <laughs> Okay, so 
I don't speak for the access of resistance, but I'll tell you how I see them. I see them as a group of state and non-state actors. So the two states are Iran and and Syria, and the non-state actors, um, as they define themselves, are Yemen's Ansar Allah, uh, which runs the Sana government and the capital. You have uh, Hezbollah, which is a non-state actor in Lebanon, uh, Lebanese resistance. You have the Iraqi resistance groups who are also non-state actors, but some of them, if you want to call them Hashta Shabi, many of them are integrated into the Iraqi army. Um, so, you know, it, it's just resistance, okay? So Hamas, the Palestinian resistance, the Palestinian Islamic Jihad, uh, some, some uh, non-Islamist Palestinian uh, groups as well, and have the Lion's Den in the West Bank, you know, whoever really once considered us as part of this. And I think, like I would say, one of the main goals of the resistance axis is to um, is to have their states be able to exercise sovereignty uh, and to shrug off foreign hegemony. Uh, these actors are not, uh, you know, they're Shia and they're Sunni, they're Islamists and they're secular they're Christian and Druze, and um, they're Iranian and Arab. They're they're not homogenous. Uh, I would say they have basic principles that's against Western hegemony and the right for states to determine their own things. Like for instance, if I want to buy or set up an electricity plant from China. I can do that. You can't do that in Lebanon. You can't do it. So these are part of, uh, I think, their political goals, and they realize that they are fighting military wars because every time there's progress, um, it gets killed by by foreign wars. You know, so uh, in 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 as, as for Syria, no, you're right. Syria has won nothing in the sense that you have. Thank you. You have. I mean, I think you know having spent nine years covering Syria, often from the ground um, during the war. Uh, I feel like Syria is in worse shape now than it was during some of the hottest times in the war because of, of the Caesar sanctions, okay? Because of sanctions. Uh, so, you know, uh, we, we honestly, uh, this is what sovereignty is about too, you know? Um, has, has Syria won? No. But what was the goal of the enemies that coalesced to bring a war to Syria, okay, where they had operations rooms in Turkey and in Jordan, all right? Um, the goal for, I think, the Americans and Israelis, et cetera, was to stop a contiguous land route from Iran to the Mediterranean. They have said this themselves, you know. Um, they wanted to stop the supply of weapons. They wanted... They wanted to stop supply, uh, stop the supply. Sorry, stop relations between these states. This, this, in some ways, has nothing to do with Iran. I mean, every one of these countries, from Iran to Iraq, Iraq to Syria, Syria to Lebanon. Anytime things make progress historically, somebody comes and ruins it. There's a coup d'état. People are thrown out, and then you have a new reality: blockage of those borders. This has always been a key. Uh, would you comment on the effect of the constant injection of U.S. money into Israeli economy? Because you had a lot on the Israeli economy, but you didn't really mention uh, how the losses are made up uh, through a constant stream of endless, uh, seemingly endless funds from the U.S. And then the notion that they that the U.S. and uh, Israel don't have the, sh the, sh the you know shared values anymore. So. It seems to me that this is precisely what the, the, the values that the U.S. has and, and its occupation and uh, dispossession of the native, if you would. And thank you to the cradle. I, I love the I love what you do. Thank you. Um, I don't know how much U.S. money goes into Israel, because even when I was living in Washington and really like much younger and focused on these kind of things, it's just hard to see. I mean, it, the, the amount of money that flows from the U.S. to Israel is deliberately hidden. It would just shock people. You know, it it comes through grants. It comes through loans that are then silently or a few years later transferred into grants. 
um, what money, uh, it, it comes through all the pension funds, all the universities. I mean, there's just a one-way flow of money to Israel. You know, and for instance, Israeli companies uh, last year after October 7th who decided to keep their earnings outside the country, their earnings outside in outside banks, the Israeli government went to the American government and said, no, you have to force them to send the money back to Israel. There's just too much cooperation on keeping um, cash inflows into Israel constantly. Now, if Israel has a war where I mean, nobody seems to be planning, like if you plan a war in any country, you have to know what your budget is. Israel's budget is limitless as long as it has its um, uh, um, irreplaceable, unconditional American partner. The U.S., of course, has its own problems. When I the Syrian war started, I think the U.S. debt was something like $21, 22000000000000 trillion. Somebody was telling me now it's $35 trillion. That's a very fast acceleration or a very short period of time. So Americans are printing money, printing money um, more in one year than their entire history put together. Printing money causes inflation. You know here, there, prices are going up. Things are doubling. Um, these things are unsustainable. And again, like I said, the U.S. cannot keep its global order or even attempt to keep, it, to keep its global order if it doesn't um, face down China directly. And it's constantly, um, you know, Ukraine here, uh, Israel there. It has to stop. It has to be able to fo focus on its main... Not that I'm encouraging it to do so. I'm just saying... Like there's this USAID is not going to be unconditional forever. Now, the values issue comes in because I, I didn't read them all out. I have a lot more quotes about Israelis and Americans talking about, you know, if the values change, this is going to be a problem. And what Chuck Schumer said, um, Israel's over if it's a pariah. OK, um, values. Americans never had values that they espouse and they talk about democracy, freedoms, et cetera. When I hear free dumb and democrazy, I like take cover. I'm thinking there's going to be an airstrike, you know. Uh, so, so literally it doesn't matter. It's, it's the, the, the fallacy of those words. Okay. Like hang on those if you want. Israel has done the same mythology with, with that language, but now Americans, you know, with their oh freedom and democracy, um, can't even look at Israel. I mean, there's, you don't even need reporters in Israel. I argue today because the amount of reports we're getting right from the ground, right from people, is astonishing. I don't think anything's been covered this well before, you know, and um, we can all see that there is no freedom, there is no democracy, that these people are literally um, inhumane. They do not consider others equal human beings. Any vestiges, any values uh, that we once thought Israel had, which never actually had, is is uh, dissipating very quickly. So um, shared values, this is when the Americans will have a hard time start, uh, uh, continuing to un unconditionally support Israel. And, you know, I always talk about tipping points. Um, you don't know what a tipping, when, when you're going to hit a tipping point. We all feel like we're coming to a tipping point. Um, some people say, oh, it's going to take forever. No, you just have to hit a tipping point, which can be a single trigger incident, and everything collapses thereafter. Hi. Uh, so thank you for the presentation. I my question is about uh, basically the war of attrition and winning the narrative. And so, like, I agree with many of the figures you presented. Like, I know a lot of these figures because I read the Cradle, I read Al Akhbar, mm -hmm. I watch Al Manar, I watch uh, Al Mayadeen. But the reality is, like, I watch them because I look for them. When you go and look on social media, when you look at your feed there is an asymmetric warfare also there. Mm -hmm. And at the same point, it's true where there are strategic victories that we're making long term, but at the same time, the way Israel fights war of attrition is through genocide and through targeting like kids, like little babies, like basically defenseless people. And so it's hard also for the people, like I'm talking about like our, like the way we win an attrition war is also we want our population to stand behind that war. So how, given the asymmetry in the, like, the media and the ability to, to produce information, the ability to disseminate information, 
how can we like peer like in this lecture or us as faculty in the university or students also like that are learning here but also interacting with people abroad outside like how can we do actual like material actions that allow us that help us like win the narrative at least in our community to make our people more resilient and are able to like continue this war of attrition I don't know how easy it is to break through um, inherited Lebanese abuse. Like, I've lived here for 12 years, and I, you know, that's not something I ever try to do. Um, the people, okay, so asymmetrically, uh, this side has already won the war. Um, I've never... In the time I've lived here, I've never seen something this big happen involving Hezbollah where, you I mean, just the March 14th community is an up in arms. Every day you're hearing nonstop. I barely, like, I have to look for Samir Jaja to hear his quote. And maybe that's because I'm reading in English in the main. I mean, you probably see in Arabic, but it is no way near, like, uh, in Tayunan, you know, the things that have happened in the past. There's nowhere near that. And I, I think, and we have people at the cradle who disagree with me, but um, uh, I think that's because Saad Hariri kind of disabled the Sunni community, the Sunni voice, when he pulled his political party out of elections to a certain extent. Um, but also, uh, Palestinians are Sunni. The war on Gaza is a war against, it just so happens, a Sunni population. The Sunni are not comfortable with this. They no longer ally or ally with the Americans and, you know, on, on this position. And um, I think we're, you know, before uh, Rafi Hariri was killed, if you looked at Lebanese polls, Sunni and Shia were here on the political spectrum of hot issues. And uh, Christians and Druze were here very generally. OK, that completely shifted. Sunni and Shia became here and here. Right. I believe, and I've written about this, that this ongoing war in Gaza is breaking through decades of Israeli and American narrative work, okay? Dividing Sunni and Shia, dividing Arab and Iranian, you know, dividing Islamist and secularists, okay? Because everybody cares about Gaza, okay? And everybody can see that Egypt, Jordan, Saudi Arabia, the UAE, you know, the, the moderate Arab states are doing nothing. The Sunni states are doing nothing. I mean, they're calling it out all over social media. Um, and, and then these awful Iranians and their awful, you know, um, proxies all over the place are the only ones doing things. And this is a big embarrassment. Everyone's trying to keep it on the down low. Asymmetrically, to me, it's it's a done deal. If if look what happened October seventh. I mean, the, it, imagine that you buy all the Israeli lies, okay, about like rape and beheading of babies and whatnot, and still the world considers Israel a pariah. That they could have taken October seventh to the bank, like they could have had six states, you know, if they'd leveraged it. But in fact, they're a pariah now. So asymmetrically, we've won this, you know. And I always say. They made those who dominate the narratives no longer um, control the outcomes on the ground. There is an efficiency in West Asia. It is in the resistance axis. It is in all other players, too, like Qatar, I find is very efficient um, uh, for different reasons. But efficiency, that those are the people who are going to win the long game. The other side is so plump used to having everything, exists in bubbles, forgets itself, forgets its budgets, okay? Rampages, that's not a strategy. It's not even a tactic. Whereas the other side, smart, strategic, incremental. You know, we cannot lose. We will win. At what cost is the only issue? Hello. Hello. Counter strategy. Uh, we're in a war of attrition with Israel. It was a very smart move from the axis of resistance, fine. But we all know the hidden objectives of the Israelis. It's not Hamas. It's basically cleaning up Palestine. Mm. 
So their counter strategy can be flipping the board of the war of attrition by bringing in the Americans, mobilizing the Jews through a crusade, let's call it a group, you can call it whatever you want, through religious wars, and using these resources to flip the war of attrition, given that the Israelis know exactly that in a war of attrition with a small geography, settler colony, small demographics, uh, relying on only external um, economic factors, is going to end up losing. So at the point, they will reach a stage where they decide to flip the board and go into uh, mobilizing now the forces of the West and mobilizing the religious war. Do you expect that? You know, there are members of the resistance axis who can't wait for American warships and American missiles and drones to be engaged because that makes American assets, military and commercial in this region, legitimate targets for retaliation. Consider that. It's, these are not the wars of yesterday. Missile technology and having arsenals of missiles has leveled the playing field so much. Um, a, you know, there was a game, a, a big war game, Pentagon war game, <laughs> 2002 Millennium Challenge. Um, and it was, I think, the most expensive U.S. war game ever commissioned um, was to run for a few weeks. And I think it was something like, I don't know, over $200 million war game. And uh, the, the, the blue team was the Americans. And this was, we, we didn't know details of it. We knew the parameters of it. This was um, a war game played in the Persian Gulf region with a Persian Gulf state, which we all knew to be Iran because there was no one else that the Americans were war gaming at that expense. Um, the red team was Iran. After 48 hours, and this is after the Americans cut off all communications for the red team, okay? They saw Iranian uh, IRGC guys on motorcycle messengers sending messages to front lines, etc. In 48 hours, the red team took out most of the U.S.'s naval assets in the Persian Gulf. So they stopped the game, reset the rules, said you can't do this, you can't do that, you can't do that, and let's start again. The head of the red team, a colonel something or other, um, quit, and he went public, which was a big deal. Um, he went public and said, we are not learning anything because we're rigging these games or cheating or resetting rules to favor ourselves so we can come out with a win. Um, I know about this, and I looked, I looked into this because a friend of mine who works at the Pentagon uh, told me a long time ago that the U.S. has never won an irregular warfare war game exercise against Iran unless it's rigged the game or cheated. Uh, so now the Iranians, you know, whatever you want to call them, uh, carpet weavers, you know, chess players, so st strategists and also patients, right? Uh, they will never rush into anything. We've seen, we've seen like with every retaliation, you know, people are like, come on now, now, nothing. It will come at their time. And, and I bet most of us who are used to the U.S.'s normalization of the hammer strategy with everything, um, are not used to the Iranian response. What does this mean? Did anything happen? Those who are interpreting it can tell you a lot. You should read the cradle. We do try to Im interpret these retaliations for the general public. But um, sorry, Daddy, what did you ask? You said, uh, do I anticipate the American? Um, I, you know what? I think it's becoming harder and harder because if the Israelis declare, do what they do, they're doing in, uh, in Gaza to the West Bank now, that is the, the, the PA, Oslo, is a U.S. and EU construct. They have funded every organization. They have underwritten every institution there. They basically are the backers of the Palestinian Authority. Um, if, if they go full on into the West Bank, um, the Americans are going to have to cut. I mean, this is it when they have to come and cut Netanyahu out, which will trigger a civil issue in Israel. I mean, 
any way you look at this, I do not anticipate an out for the Israelis. I think we've passed that point. Um, anything an external party does to Israel will trigger an opposition inside Israel. Okay, the Americans come and fight. It's not, you can, your missiles, Iranian missiles, Hezbollah missiles, Yemeni missiles, okay, drones. A drone from Yemen hit Tel Aviv. It went through all kinds of territories to get there. You know, there's a lot of stuff that has it, you know, on the military ladder. We're really way low down. There's, I don't see, I think, I think with missiles, we, it is the big equalizing force. You know, when, when Qasem Soleimani, the head of the Ghuts Force, IRGC's Ghuts Force, was assassinated by the Americans, um, the night of the retaliation, Iran sent out messages to Qatar, all basically all uh, um, Persian Gulf states that had U.S. bases, U.S. military presence there, and said, if one aircraft, if one missile, if one drone um, is launched from your territory, you will be considered a legitimate target. Nothing happened. There was an absolute American non-reaction, okay? So increasingly, the Americans are finding themselves very... They, as much as they bang on about Iran, they never wanted. The Pentagon never wants to ever get into a war with Iran because they know that they don't know some stuff. Okay. Nobody's asked you about journalism. Okay, hi, another time. <laughs> My questions are very simple and not as geopolitical as the others. Yeah. Now, the two small questions. First of all, you mentioned China being on the other axis against uh, Israel. Although I have not yet seen any news or anything come out of China that ever criticized Israel or is against Israel. On the contrary, we know that China still gets chips from Israel. American chips, the only country in the world allowed to give China chips without sanctions is Israel. So I don't know why you based this idea or why you spoke about this idea that China is on the other side. I think China is not. It's somewhere in the middle. My second question, or this was a comment, my question is, how long do you think this war will go on? I think the war will go on as long as Israel continues to fight. You should be sitting here. I mean, I think it's kind of become apparent to everybody. It's not looking for a ceasefire. It's trying every out and with the ceasefire negotiations. It's moving the goalpost. It doesn't want to stop. Okay. I mean you as a journalist, someone yeah. with information, someone who follows this much oh, better no, no. than I do. I, do you have an estimate, an idea, a discussion? Because I don't. Let me just tell you something, okay? As opposed to what many people have called me since I started covering the Syrian work. I'm not an Assadist. I'm not a Putinist. I'm not a Khamenei-ist. I literally don't know these people. Um, I've never met them. I've never asked to meet them. Um, I know very few officials from these countries. I just do work. Um, I, I often find as a journalist that the worst thing you want to do is interview an official because they say nothing. Um, the few times I've interviewed officials, I've had like my thing is like we have to have at least an hour or more and we have to have a conversation. Question answer doesn't work. But I don't know what these people are thinking. Um, but uh, I have learned to trust my own instincts to a certain extent. Now, when I say China is in this group, it, I'm not saying that. Uh, China, actually, like Russia and like Iran, are open to everyone. They're open to everyone. Iran deals with Turkey while Turkey's stabbing in its back. Doesn't matter. It's, it's uh, frenemies. Okay, there's a lot of frenemies out there. China and Iran and Russia play this amazing long game of strategic ambiguity it is so smart. There were so many times during the Syrian war where we saw headlines like, is Putin going to drop Assad? All the time, every year. That continued indefinitely, you know, or will Iranians drop Assad? There were always, this, we, these countries stay ambiguous because they're strategic thinkers, okay? They don't know how things are going to be four months down the road. They're open to all possibilities. They act in their own self-interest, that is not an awful thing. That is normal nation-state behavior. States should act in their own interests, okay? Um, China acts in its own interests. China will deal with everybody. Um, but what's increasingly happening, and this is an American 
um, problem is the U.S. keeps pushing uh, these major players, okay, and global actors more and more together by identifying them as adversaries. It's in all their military front pages for the last 15 years. China's number one enemy, Russia's number one enemy, and then the sanctions. And then the, you know, anywhere where, where, where China is, has moved ahead of the U.S., like 5G, for instance, suddenly Huawei gets sanctioned and, and you can't buy Huawei phones or use them. What, what I'm saying is um, China will stay open till the very end, but China is increasingly falling in this camp. Now, I want to say one thing really quickly. This is something I've been thinking for a long time. I've always thought and found it really hard to write about because people would be like, what are you talking about? Um, China, Russia, and Iran are very different countries, but very similar outlook on many things. This is why... 10 years ago, I could tell you that this would be happening now. All three of them believe that international law protects them because what underpins international law is two things, sovereignty and territorial integrity, because that is, that is, th those are the foundations of the nation state unit. The nation state unit is what our international order is based on. Um, these three countries believe international law will protect it, if applied, okay? These three countries prefer to lead with soft power than hard power, okay? Hard power is the very, 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 very last thing on their minds. Um, these three countries have a healthy fear of their own populations. If a million people go on the streets, they will react. There's a shortage of chicken. You'll find chicken within a week in your stores. They react. It's not like in the West where something happens, nobody cares. Nobody cares, okay? They don't fear their own populations because they have security forces. Yes, you have them in these countries too, but not if there's a critical mass of people complaining about a legitimate grievance, okay? Um, I think, uh, I think uh, these three countries want to move forward with economic development. The Chinese talk about peaceful modernization, as opposed to what we have in our global order now, which is never-ending war, okay? So China jump-started a multi-trillion dollar project to connect Asia and Europe to each other via roads, railways, pipelines. Beautiful project. Made the Americans crazy. Guess what? Shipping routes that are all like Western-dominated by and large, insurance company networks that are Western-dominated, even financial systems. Now, because the Americans have put sanction screws on these three countries, they've come together to talk about um, uh, alternative currencies based on commodities, not like just paper printing, right? Um, and they've also initiated now for a number of years trading in billions of dollars in non-Western currencies, and that is slowly making the U.S. reserve currency redundant. Um, so when I say when China is on this side, China did Iran uh, brokered Iran uh, Saudi um, rapprochement. China got 14 Palestinian factions to Beijing a month ago, um, pushing them to come together under the auspices of the PLO, so all Palestinian factions could be represented in one body and move towards an agenda of uh, national liberation. So. Uh, China's not here or there. This is not its priority, okay? But it's fast becoming because these are the roots of China's Belt and Road Initiative. West Asia, and I just want to give one hopeful thing, you know, but this is so important for me to say, West, so Middle East is full of all these, like, you know, uh, Arab Malays, uh, we lost, we're just useless, how can we ever defeat them, uh, right? Um, West Asia is not that. West Asia is this massive corridor, okay, resource-rich, massive corridor um, between Asia and Europe. We are it. We are the corridor. Well, no, you, okay, fine, but but this is this is this is the corridor. The, the, that's true. And I think we need to, and I think Russia, China, Iran, and others are, I mean, Africa is coming into the BRICS in a bigger way now. But imagine that Turkey, Iraq, Turkey, Syria, Iraq, and Iran, okay? Four civilizational states. By the way, this is not entirely my thinking. Anis Nakash, 
uh, is, oh, I miss him so much, you know, very independent minded guy. Um, I love his idea, uh, four civilizational states, um, tour Sunni, tour Shia, tour Arab, tour non-Arab, bring them together in a confederation, just economic and trade confederation. They will control every route between Asia and Europe. You become the hub of the world. It's such an easy solution. Of course, the Americans will not allow this, but the Russians encourage it. The Chinese would like to build the roads to make this possible. And then West Asia can take its place as the center of global or a center of global commerce. I, I believe, you know, in the future, if you, well, if you left it to me, Bay, Lebanon would become the Hong Kong of West Asia. It's it, the, the resources here, the, the um, uh, entrepreneurial spirit, uh, just the, this long legacy of people living here for thousands and thousands of years. This is such a perfect place for this. And I believe this is possible. But you have to get rid of foreign hegemony first. Thank you. <laughs> Hello. Hi. This might be a bit uh, uncomfortable given like the topic we're talking about, but I think it's important to shed light on. So how can we balance between being like anti-imperialist, anti-US, support the axis of resistance, but also not deny genocides being committed by the Assad regime? Um, like we know that the US is benefiting from this, uh, from the Syrian war. But we also shouldn't fall into the black and white thinking by painting Assad as like the angel of the resistance. Yeah. I knew I'd get this at AUB. Um, actually, I, uh, you'd be hard pressed. I mean, I think in co my coverage of the Syrian war, you, uh, many people assumed I was pro-government when I never actually took a position on it. Um, I would say that if you liked my coverage before the Syrian war, uh, when I was writing for the Huffington Post for a couple of years, then um, you should have liked uh, my Syrian war coverage because it was essentially the same. It was anti-foreign um, interventions in this region, um, dictating to us what we should do, who we should buy for. Um, I, I think sovereignty is a very important principle. And if we were able in Lebanon to... Um, exercise sovereignty, we would have running water, electricity, and much, much more. Um, so uh, in that sense, uh, you can talk about Assad killing people, but it's a refrain that um, irritates me no end because I actually did three pieces. I was only one doing detailed forensic pieces on the casualty counts in the early part of the war. And from the beginning, there was absolute parity, okay? So when the death toll was 5,000 in Syria, over 2,600 of those, per the UN Commission's report, were Syrian security forces dead, all right? So you cannot, I mean, in a war, people die. Um, in the death toll, I mean, nobody died. ISIS was in Syria. Nusra was in Syria. 54 uh, fighting battalions supported by the Americans, the Israelis, the Jordanians, the whatever, just in the Southern Theater. Forget the, 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 the Turkish uh, decision-making hub. Uh, Assad, I mean, I, I can't because it comes from such a wrong place. There was a war waged on Syria. From the first months, we saw weapons coming across the Lebanese border, people here, okay, saw that. Uh, we saw them coming from Turkey. Turkey became the biggest hub. They came from Iraq. They came from Jordan. And, and we know these were funded by a lot of Gulf countries. It was funded by the Americans, the Europeans, etc. There was a war on Syria. Who are you talking about Assad kill people? I'm sure he did. I, 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 I'm not here to pass judgment on that. I was against the imperialist war on Syria that used Gulf resources and NATO resources to fight a war on a state, a state that was um, socialist in its structure, meaning 
Everyone had food, education, healthcare, basics, right? Not a w- wealthy country in terms of natural resources. A state that didn't have natural debt. I, I am sure that the Mukhabarat are very repressive there. But after seeing this war, I understand why. Because you may forget that in the late 70s and early 80s, the same thing happened in Hama. And 100 years before, there were uh, people cutting off heads in Damascus. No wonder Syria acts like this. I don't care. I mean, I once had to go somewhere with some Mukhabarat people, and they actually looked like stereotypical, like Saddam Hussein guys with like, like they were older, but dyed black hair and they were like friendly until they weren't you know it was it was unnerving i would never want to be in one of my fellow journalists who would also be labeled Assadis was beaten up and put in prison with these guys it's not it's a war what do you want me to say like i'm not going to defend that at the same time don't pretend that this didn't start by people trying to kill syria